Now let's try making this thermal system a little more complicated and look at the transient response of multiple components together in a system. So imagine we had our coffee and this could just as easily be the uh, bed of a uh, 3D printer or any other thing that we were trying to control. It's no longer infinite. It's got a finite size and it's still a temperature T coffee. It's interacting with the sensor and it's also interacting with ambient air. And we're still going to treat the ambient air as if it's infinite. We're in a really big room. This time though, our sensor, we're reading the temperature with our microcontroller and using that microcontroller to turn a heater on and off to try to keep the coffee or the 3D printer bed or whatever warm enough to match a temperature that we'd like it to be at. And we're using the sensor input to control that heater and turn it on and off. So we can do the same kind of balance that we did when we looked at just the sensor and how its transient response behaved, except this time we're going to have to follow both the transient response of the coffee and the sensor. So if we do two control masses, we'll have a mass of coffee and cup here. And here's the mass of the sensor. And they're interacting with each other, and they're both interacting with the air. In addition, the heater is interacting with the coffee. So, the energy in the coffee will depend on how much coffee there is, so the mass of the coffee, and its specific heat, and the temperature of the coffee. So the more coffee, the larger the specific heat of coffee, which is pretty close to the specific heat of water, or the higher the temperature, the more energy there will be in the coffee. And we better keep track of that by putting a subscript C on all of that to recognize that that's the coffee. Likewise, we can look at the total amount of energy that's in the sensor, and it'll be the mass times the specific heat times the temperature for the sensor. Now, the specific heats will be similar, the temperatures are similar, and the masses are way different. The sensor is way smaller than the coffee. So I expect that the energy contained in the sensor is going to be way smaller than the energy contained in the coffee. And I expect the sensor is going to respond more quickly than the coffee to our transient response. So let's look at how would the energy in the coffee or the energy in the sensor change with time. Let's look at the sensor. The rate of change with time of the amount of energy in the sensor is just the energy coming into the sensor per unit time. That's QCS, the amount of energy per unit. Uh, unit time, so this is in units of watts, coming into the sensor minus what's going out of the sensor. So if there's more going out than coming in, the derivative will be negative. If there's more coming in than is going out, the derivative will be positive. The energy will go up and correspondingly the temperature will go up. So it's just Q coming in from the coffee to the sensor minus Q going out from the sensor to the air. And if we assume that the mass and the specific heat aren't changing, the sensor stays the same and its properties remain the same, then all that we're seeing is that the temperature is increasing. So the rate of change of temperature of the sensor with time will be QCS minus QSA and then it'll depend on the mass and specific heat divided by the mass and specific heat for the sensor. Or if we take a really short time step, so delta T small, then we'll see an increase in temperature over that short time in the sensor equal to QCS minus QSA over mass and specific heat of the sensor times the short time over which we're working. Likewise, if we want to know what's going on with the coffee, we'll wind up with the change in temperature of the coffee depending on 
the heat coming in from the heater, so QHC, the amount of watts we're putting in from the heater, minus whatever went out to the sensor, Q from the coffee to the sensor, minus whatever went out to the air, Q from the coffee to the air, all divided by MCP, the mass and specific heat, the for the coffee and the cup together. All times delta T, the short time step. Now where do we get the things that go into here? Well, we need to know about the properties of our sensor, its mass and specific heat, and the properties of our coffee and cup, its mass and specific heat, or whatever this block is. We need to know what Q uh, uh, HC is, and that really depends on our program. It depends on our control strategy. So our control strategy might be something as simple as turn the heater on whenever the temperature registered here is too cold and warm the coffee back up. Then when the coffee warms up enough, turn it off again. That's a fairly simple control strategy one that's used with uh, household thermostats and things like that. Q from the coffee to the sensor, well we know from before that that's going to depend on a heat transfer coefficient that we really need to figure out more about heat transfer to know what it is, but it'll, it'll be something, some value. The area, how large the area is where those two interact between the coffee and the sensor times T coffee minus T sensor. And we know that this and the mass and specific heat are going to be related to the time constant that we see. So we should be able to pull that out. Likewise, the heat transfer from the sensor to the air, just like before, HA from the sensor to the air times the temperature of the sensor minus the temperature of the air. And finally, from the coffee to the air will be HA from the coffee to the air times the difference between the coffee temperature and the air temperature. Now if we can put all of this together we ought to be able to get a solution. It's going to be a little too, complica too complex to do an analytical solution but we can tackle it in a spreadsheet. For each time step as we go forward we go forward by delta T each time the ambient temperature is held as a constant. The heat is either off or on, depending on whether the sensor is below or above the set point. The plate temperature is taken from the previous plate temperature, plus any gain from the heater, minus any losses to the sensor, which is colder than the plate, plus, or sorry, minus any losses to the ambient, which is colder than the plate. These input parameters are important to determining that formula. Time step, how far forward we're going in time. How well energy is transferred from the plate to the sensor. And how much power is coming from the heater. What the capacity of the plate is, how much energy it takes to heat it up by one degree Celsius. And finally, how readily heat is transferred from the plate to the air. This plot plots all the data from our temperature history information. And changing the parameters up here will change what we see on the plot. So if I go from three seconds down to two seconds on the time step, I see more detail over a shorter period of time. Changing other parameters will change how the system responds. So if the sensor was heavier, say 0.5 instead of 0.1, it would respond much more slowly and things go off the graph. If I switch that back to point one and make the transfer from the plate to the sensor much more effective, 
then I see that the sensor temperature follows the plate temperature much more closely. They're much closer together. Switching that back to where I had it, which I think is a reasonable value, we see that the plate temperature is getting up fairly high, up to 70 degrees Celsius, even though our target was to only get it to 60 degrees Celsius. That's because the sensor never quite catches up with the plate. You can load up this spreadsheet yourself and change some of the parameters to see what happens. When you're changing the parameters, you may need to change the scaling of the graphs in order to see the results. This is an Apple Numbers spreadsheet. I've got an Excel spreadsheet on D2L for you that has exactly the same calculations in it, but it's not as neatly formatted.